ladies and gentlemen, um, apologies for the slight delay with uh, uh, kicking off this afternoon's uh, session of the Sokashi Trades uh, Masterclass series, where we have been looking uh, at three value chains, um, that is a French beans, peas, and avocado. And the whole objective is to examine how we can optimize production and market access for these um, commodities. They uh, are an important um, part of a horticulture industry for this country. Um, they've been big uh, in the export sector. And of course, even domestically, we've been seeing increased uh, consumption of this particular horticultural fresh produce. Um, through this series, which is a partnership between SOCA, the Society of Crop Agribusiness Advisors of Kenya, a body of uh, advisors and consultants in the agribusiness space, and the ITC She Trades Commonwealth uh, Program, which is a program that is looking at facilitating women-owned um, agribusinesses to access markets and be sustainable in growing their businesses. We have been collaborating and uh, uh, bringing various experts on board to share with us their insights uh, on how we can actually optimize production uh, for these commodities and even improve our market access. And we have this afternoon with us um, an expert on avocado horticulture and uh, in general and avocado uh, in particular on matters of production. So the, today's segment is going to dwell heavily on matters of production. Um, I am standing in for a moderator who will be joining us uh, shortly, but without much further ado, even as I invite you to introduce yourself on the chat box and to take a minute to click on the survey link that uh, uh, will be shared on the same, I would just want to ask, um, our main presenter, Dr. Samuel Were, to introduce himself briefly, and then um, we shall get into his presentation uh, thereafter. So, Karibu, Dr. Were. Thank you very much, uh, Ricky. I think I can. Uh... Sorry, Samuel, we seem not to be hearing you. Hello, you can now be able to hear me. Yes. Oh, wonderful. Uh, my name is uh, Samuel Were, I'm a lecturer at the Jomo Kenyatta University of Agriculture and Technology, and uh, I'm a member of uh, SOCA. I'm, uh, expert in crop protection, agronomy, uh, as well as uh, in food safety and uh, issues uh, to do with uh, also growing and uh, management of uh, pests in uh, uh, different uh, types of crops. And today we are uh, looking at uh, uh, avocado. And uh, I don't know if uh, Ricky wanted us to continue or uh, to... Uh, do other, someone else needs to do an introduction? Um, I think Samuel, in a, yeah, we'll let you proceed with the presentation. I think you just need to check that you can uh, share from your end. But, Try start sharing on uh, your end. I don't know if okay. you've received it. We have, have the presentation. Yes. You have it? Yeah, yes. kindly start sharing. I'll uh, share as we continue. I think uh, my machine has uh, caused a problem with the sharing, but you can start and then I'll continue with uh, yours and uh, then share. I'll let you know when I can be able to share kindly. Okay, just a minute.
Thank you. Thank you, Ricky. Um, just to start us off, I would like to uh, go through uh, just a general introduction on uh, uh, avocado. And uh, just as a general introduction, you know, avocado is an important uh, commercial uh, fruit in uh, the country and uh, both for local consumption as well as for export uh, markets in the country. And uh, in addition to avocado being used as uh, food or uh, fruit for that matter, it is also gaining wide uh, use as uh, a constituent for uh, different uh, cosmetic uh, products, uh, which may result from the avocado oil and the avocado uh, itself. I'm sure our sisters are, uh, will uh, uh, articulate well with that component uh, of uh, the cosmetic uh, area. Uh, to continue with, uh, we know that the crop in Kenya is grown across a wide range uh, of agroecological zones. And uh, with the current uh, entrance uh, in this uh, production of agro uh, of avocado being uh, the North Rift and uh, South Rift uh, regions and Western uh, parts of the country, that is uh, including or rather to add on to the uh, other parts which have uh, always uh, grown this, which is the Central Kenya and Eastern regions uh, of this country. Uh, so the new entrants, uh, maybe uh, three years now, which have already started harvesting now in large scale. At the same time, we may realize uh, for a long period of time, uh, production has been uh, done with mainly uh, the small scale growers. And currently we are going, uh, we are currently going towards the use of um, uh, large scale growers are now coming in to produce uh, more and more of uh, the avocado. And uh, we will be able to uh, see other aspects depending, doesn't matter whether large scale, small scale, but what is important is uh, the management of uh, the avocado itself. Maybe we can go to the next uh, slide, uh, Ricky. Next slide, Ricky, please. Yes. Uh, some common uh, varieties uh, of avocado uh, grown. Uh, mainly, we have uh, has. I've not picked all of them. Picked about uh, four of them, and for a particular reason, the fourth one uh, we tend to utilize a lot of it. Uh, mainly, we have has, which is characterized by its uh, dark purple uh, color. Uh, when uh, ripe, and uh, it has a good shelf life. The has has a good shelf life and has moderate spreading habit. And uh, with a recommended spacing, um, just trying to cover even the spacing briefly in here because they'll vary. And in the other areas, we'll be looking at them uh, generally. Has recommended spacing being uh, seven meters by eight meters. It matures uh, between uh, eight and nine months after flowering, the, it should be mature and ready for harvesting. Then it has a flower type A. And uh, when you're referring to the flower type, why I'm bringing in uh, the issue of the flower type, you'll be able to understand. You'll find that uh, avocado with flower type A uh, do show the receptive uh, female parts of the flower uh, in the mornings and uh, the receptive male parts of the flower do end up being shown in the afternoon of the following day. And uh, that's why I've put a small picture of the floral parts that will just help us to understand the central one being the stigma, which is the receptive part um, of the female when it is ready to receive the pollen. And uh, so uh, this particular uh, avocado, you'll find mainly they are not self-pollinated and therefore it is important to understand the flower type so that you can be able to know how the cross-pollination uh, may occur. And uh, for Fuete variety, it is characterized uh, by a green and thin, uh, slightly rough skin, not as rough as uh, 
the uh, Hus uh, variety has a wide spreading uh, habit and uh, it grows wider than uh, the Hus variety. Therefore, its recommended spacing will be eight meters by uh, 10 uh, meters. And uh, for my, uh, it matures six to eight months after uh, flowering. And therefore, if you want to be able to gauge the period of flowering, you should be able to uh, do that between eight of, uh, between that uh, period of time. And the flower type here is flower type B. And uh, the flower type B, this one, receptive female parts uh, do uh, get exposed from the flower in the afternoon and uh, the receptive male parts which uh, will the bees can help in pollinating will become uh, open or uh, can uh, be uh, observed in the morning of the following day. So you'll find that this particular variety may not really undertake cross, uh, uh, may not pollinate uh, themselves. And uh, to overcome this many a times, we have looked at uh, introducing some of the different types of flowers uh, habits, flower types uh, adjacent to an orchard just to enable uh, proper uh, pollination to take place. Then we have got Pinkerton, uh, which is uh, uh, also um, a green type of uh, avocado. And the fruits are long pear shaped with uh, a dark pale green uh, color. And uh, the tree has a moderate spreading habit, though it bears heavily and it's a regular, uh, it does bear regularly. Uh, this particular uh, fruit actually has a recommended spacing of six by six meters based on its uh, habit and it is a flower type A. Then now uh, we can look at the other variety which we re normally call Jumbo. If we could move to the next slide, Ricky, that would be good. We have the Jumbo variety, uh, which uh, actually is mainly used as a rootstock and it's usually referred to as the local uh, variety. It has a dark or rather a brown uh, skin uh, when ripe. And uh, this one is used as a rootstock by many farmers because it has uh, resistance. Uh, to quite a number of root rot uh, diseases, and therefore it can be able to withstand the different uh, diseases or uh, different abiotic stresses. And uh, it has a green flesh, it is uh, quite uh, mostly marketed, and uh, it has also a very rapid uh, growth. And it requires a spacing of around eight meters to 10 uh, meters. When we come to the agroecological uh, zones, the agroecological zones, uh, you'll find that the altitude range for production of uh, avocado uh, is between 1200 meters to uh, 2100 meters above uh, sea level. Uh, however, you'll find uh, varieties like uh, Haas, and uh, we have a different one also called Nabal, are uh, suited for altitudes of uh, 800 to 2,100 meters uh, above uh, sea level. Fuerte, on the other hand, and uh, Puebella, Puebella, which may also be used uh, as a rootstock uh, because it is it also uh, portrays quite some resistance uh, to diseases. Uh, it's its temp, its uh, range is between 1,500 meters above sea level and 2,000. 100 meters above sea level. When we look at uh, the rainfall distribution, uh, you find the requirements for uh, rainfall for an avocado tree. Uh, it is uh, not less uh, areas where they do not receive uh, less than 1,000 uh, uh, millimeters and 1,600 millimeters per annum. However, in areas that receive less than uh, this amount of rainfall, it is recommended uh, that uh, it is recommended uh, that irrigation is uh, undertaken, and uh, 
that is during the dry seasons, where we look at uh, an irrigation of around 25 millimeters uh, uh, per week uh, when it's dry. However, we have to really observe and ensure that we do not uh, overwater, we do not overwater the trees because once we overwater the trees and there is a lot of uh, moisture in the ground, we will find uh, we do not have, uh, we end up having other problems, root problems like uh, anthrac um, fusarium, uh, root problems and root rot may end up developing heavily uh, in uh, avocado. Then optimum temperature ranges should be between 20 and 24 degrees uh, Celsius. Uh, we are just talking about optimum. This temp temperature ranges may uh, slightly go beyond, but that may also interfere or affect uh, the productivity of the tree. We're looking at uh, areas with the deep and well-drained uh, fertile sandy or alluvial loam soils. And uh, we're looking at uh, uh, alluvial uh, loam soils reason uh, mainly being uh, we, we, we need soils that are free draining so that we do not have uh, a lot of moisture in the soil which will in turn enhance and uh, uh, the production of zoospores thereby causing uh, diseases uh, to occur. Uh, another important aspect we need to look at uh, is uh, on the pH range, which will be between five and seven, uh, the pH of five and seven. This is of importance because it also affects the uptake of different nutrients, as well as also it affects also, uh, the development of other biotic uh, uh, problems or uh, diseases, which are mainly fungal uh, diseases. Uh, uh, we can move, uh, Ricky, kindly, uh, to the, let's look at now uh, the establishment uh, of uh, avocado. And uh, in the establishment in Kenya, most of the avocado trees, we understand, are uh, planted from nurseries or are sourced from different various types of nurseries. And uh, there are uh, important aspects that we need to consider, one of them that we must ensure that this, uh, where we are getting our seed or our planting material from, that those nurseries have been registered by Horticultural Crops Directorate. And at the same time, the seed, uh, seedlings have been inspected by the Kenya Plant Health Inspectorate Services, uh, what that is KEFIS, and that these particular nurseries are also re uh, registered with the county uh, government. And therefore, these uh, seedlings can there then be uh, categorized as, uh, as being um, rather certified seedlings. And that is the importance because there are many things that will go into the production of the certified seedlings amongst them. One of them, we are looking at the mother block establishment. And this uh, is just basically for those of us who would want now to establish our own uh, nurseries to be able to propagate our own seedlings. One of the important things we have to understand when you're looking at the mother block establishment, you're looking at establishing uh, planting stock uh, that is maintained mainly for the purpose of either gating your seeds for the purposes of establishment of the rootstock or establishing a block or plant population basic for the purpose of getting sources of the scion. So if you have a well-maintained uh, mother block, then you'll be able to get all these materials to establish a nursery that will then give you uh, certified uh, seedlings that you should be able to use. One of the most important factors that we need to look at when we are uh, establishing a mother block uh, is to ensure that uh, the soil um, analysis has been undertaken. And also we need to be uh, to ensure that the, there is an interpretation, a proper interpretation of the soil analysis report. And uh, this should be conducted prior to the establishment, because once you have undertaken this, it will guide uh, in 
the purposes of liming or the purposes of uh, addition of nutrients prior and also during uh, the, uh, the, the during your growing or your production uh, period. And uh, when undertaking this soil analysis, it is advised to be able to take at two different uh, depths. Uh, to the first depth being at zero uh, to 30 uh, centimeters of the topsoil, which should be analyzed. And at the same time, uh, it is important to analyze uh, the subsoil, which is uh, zero, uh, rather 30 or 31 uh, to uh, 50 centimeters of the subsoil, so as to be able to understand what nutrients are in these particular soils what amount of uh, manure you need to apply in these particular soils. And if you need to do any liming, the, you can be able to do liming to bring up the pH. If the pH is indeed below, uh, if your pH is indeed below uh, five, uh, have the measure of uh, five. Uh, if we could move to the next slide, which is the field establishment. Uh, whereby we are looking at uh, the preparation of the planting holes. It is important uh, when we are preparing to start because we cannot be able to get good production and for prolonged periods if we start on a wrong footing. So at the beginning, it is important to ensure that the land is well cleared and well uh, dug uh, deep enough. and. Uh, you ensure that you remove all the top uh, soil first and dig through in and get holes that are around two feet uh, by two feet or holes that are uh, two feet uh, in diameter and two feet uh, deep. And uh, the spacing in between uh, these particular holes uh, is uh, dependent on the variety as we have seen, those different varieties we are talking about, which require uh, different uh, uh, spacing. Uh, we, uh, you also, like us, when we were talking about us and uh, we were looking at them having a spacing of uh, seven by eight meters. So that's what will guide uh, our holes and the spacing. Then the soil fertility is also a critical in determining the spacing uh, of your holes, because in areas that you have very fertile soils, it is advisable that you do uh, a wider spacing just to ensure that the canopy of the different trees do not come uh, to touch or do not close up, because once they close up, they may uh, cause problems with the lighting uh, penetrating into the tree, and uh, that may result into other factors like dampness, uh, and uh, other diseases, and also the quality of the fruits may not uh, be uh, good uh, enough. And uh, climatic conditions, what you're referring to, you're just referring to, uh, it's okay, just go uh, move forward. Uh, what climatic conditions, what you're referring to, there we just uh, referring to when looking at the rainfall, uh, amount of rainfall that is received uh, during uh, different particular uh, periods. And that is with the uh, establishment and uh, how we need to do our holes. And once we've uh, gotten the right uh, media, uh, rather mix of the soil, because we are looking at uh, growing uh, our avocado actually in the ground and not in pots. Although there are other uh, methods of growing, which include growing in pots. Now in field management, it is important uh, to ensure Aspects uh, such as mulching uh, is undertaken, uh, that is after uh, planting, uh, because uh, this mulch uh, does help in uh, preventing some uh, pests and uh, to, from growing uh, in the soil or replicating in the soil. Mulching is also important because it reduces the amount of uh, uh, moisture loss and uh, therefore it is important to ensure that we have undertaken um, mulching in our crops. Um, another important aspect uh, we want to look at is the supplemental uh, irrigation uh, in case there is a failure 
of rainfall. So for supplemental irrigation, uh, we had talked about 25 millimeters uh, required for about uh, a week. Uh, but many other people may want to look at uh, how many liters may you uh, need uh, to apply. But we are looking at uh, an ap approximation of five to 20 liters of water. And this is dependent on the size of the seedling or the size of the tree, because a mature tree may require up to 20 liters of supplemental uh, irrigation water that is uh, in the event the rainfall uh, does uh, fail. That is one area that uh, many uh, people have uh, decided not to really look into and decided that we are doing uh, rain fed and uh, more so uh, because we do not want to go into the issues of water, uh, of, uh, uh, water analysis uh, before we engage in uh, irrigation. Uh, under fertilization, it is important at the beginning uh, even when you are doing your holes, uh, it's important to look at uh, using some uh, well decomposted uh, manure. I wouldn't like to limit us to uh, what type of manure we need to uh, take, but it is important that we look at, uh, uh, we know the amount of manure that we are uh, applying. About one wheelbarrow is enough, which is equivalent to 15 uh, kilograms uh, in that hole. And uh, I've given us a guide uh, to uh, manure application uh, based on the edge of the tree. So the guide is just based on the edge of the tree. And uh, looking at it, we're looking at uh, trees at the age of one to three years, you need to give at least CAN uh, 125 grams uh, D, DSP, uh, which is double super phosphate, around 225 uh, grams. And uh, you also need a uh, farmyard manure of uh, 15 uh, kilos. Now we are looking at what uh, we need to apply because even as the tree grows, it continues depleting the various uh, nutrients in the soils. And this is a guide and you see the level of uh, grams keep on increasing with the age of the tree, which can go to trees which are above 15 years, taking up to uh, 1.3 kilos uh, of uh, CAN. And at that particular moment, because the roots are uh, quite uh, deep, uh, you find we are uh, not looking at application of manure at that uh, particular stage. Uh, when we continue with field management, there is an important aspect uh, in uh, pruning, when we are looking uh, at pruning. And uh, it is important to prune uh, our crops at an early uh, stage, which is uh, just before, which should be before uh, flowering. And uh, upon just after we have completed the harvesting uh, session, and before we, the crop starts uh, flowering again, uh, it is important to go into pruning uh, once again, uh, because this will help us to produce the tree to produce vegetative uh, parts. From these vegetative parts, that's where you're going to get the shoot that will uh, provide uh, the support for this tree and proper leaf uh, area that will en enable uh, us to get proper uh, crop. And also we are looking at encouraging uh, lateral growth of shoots uh, because we would like it also uh, to grow sideways and minimize a little bit of uh, growth uh, upwards for purposes of management. And uh, we also do this to manage the branching and uh, open lighting. It ensures that the canopy height is always maintained at uh, an area. Uh, between 70% uh, of the rows, because what you, would, you wouldn't want, uh, if you have your rows being eight uh, meters, you would like uh, the canopy of the tree 
being uh, at uh, about five or six meters high. This is for purposes of allowing light also into the tree. Because if the canopy goes beyond the uh, size of the uh, your rose, it will indeed affect, it will indeed affect the light that is coming in or penetrating into the tree and uh, it will affect the uh, production. And then uh, thinning, uh, it is important because it is just the removal of uh, uh, some already formed fruits. Uh, many other times uh, farmers will want to have a tree that is very full and uh, yes, it is good, but then it is important that we supplement with nutrients. But if we find that the tree is overbearing, it is important to be able to thin or to pluck off some of the fruits formed. And uh, for this purpose, it is to be able to ensure high quality uh, fruits and not just getting uh, a very tiny little fruits. But if we are able to supplement the tree with the nutrients, yes, we can be able to allow the tree to have, uh, rather to bear very uh, heavily. And uh, uh, also there is another important aspect. We were looking at uh, the trees going beyond 70% of the rows. There is an important aspect that needs to be undertaken, which we refer to stamping. And uh, this stamping is just being able to uh, cut back uh, the trees to about four feet uh, height and leaving around uh, two uh, feet stubs. And this enables the to bring down uh, the tree uh, canopy and uh, enable uh, other management practices to be carried out and other uh, shoots to come up and uh, be able to continue producing. An important aspect that has to be undertaken whenever we are doing stamping or thinning, it is important that after we have done this, we do apply uh, uh, either uh, white, uh, we do apply either uh, copper on those particular areas that we have uh, pruned or thinned for purposes of preventing any infection uh, of the trees. And then weeding is also important uh, because this one helps us to reduce uh, competition. And uh, since we had started mentioning earlier on about uh, aspects of uh, uh, the other aspects about uh, mulching, that one will help us even when it comes uh, to weeding because what we really uh, need to look at uh, is the canopy uh, size. And uh, kindly, if you could just go back one slide backward, we we'll look at that canopy area we are talking about. Yes, now, uh, like that tree that we, right there, yes, thank you. That tree we have uh, put over there, it is uh, the area that looks colored, that uh, is right below the edge of the tree, uh, the, the leaves of that, or rather the edge of the branches of the leaves. And that is the area whereby we are seeing uh, at the roots reaching. The feeding roots are getting to that particular colored, or rather checked um, ring. So when you're applying fertilizer and other management uh, strategies we are applying, we need not to apply right at the stump area, but we need to do the application uh, the canopy edges directly below the canopy edges because the canopy edges in, instruct us the area where the roots are reaching, the roots that uh, the plant relies on for feeding, for uptake of the nutrients and the moisture. That is the area around which we need uh, to take care of. Uh, we may proceed and uh, go to the next. Uh, slide after the weeds and look at, uh, we can go ahead one more slide. Thank you. After weeds, one um, Samuel, maybe yes. uh, if I may inter interrupt. Yes. Just yes. to, to, for purpose 
process of clarification. Yes. Clarification. I see we are moving to. Uh, yes. So just a few questions um, uh, we are receiving. Um, so yeah. we have uh, two particular questions I just wanted to pose to you. I think the first sure. one is asking about the the uh, the specific areas where uh, avocado can be planted, um, and I think this is with reference to the altitudes that you uh, you had shared. So we have someone asking if you could um, highlight uh, some of those areas where uh, the avocado can be planted, and uh, we also have a question on irrigation. Um, if you could say yes. something about how exactly irrigation can be uh, can be done, uh, where irrigation is being used, what is the type of irrigation, and um, I think maybe this particular question may not have had uh, your comment. Um, when you talked of the amount of irrigation water, uh, yes. what frequency are we uh, using? Uh, those guidelines for and then the last question is with regards to this this uh, guidelines where you mentioned that the nursery should be um, registered uh, by HCD inspected by KFIS and uh, also registered at the county government for someone who's going to source uh, seedlings um, and is not aware of this kind of uh, requirements. How do they identify a certified uh, nursery? Is there a kind of a code um, or is there a service where they can send uh, a short code, uh, uh, an SMS and get uh, some kind of confirmation? Maybe you could just touch on those ones, I think, um, uh, because they relate to the first uh, part where you've talked about field establishment, uh, and then we can proceed. Thanks. All right, thank you, Ricky. Uh, to start with, uh, there are various areas where we are looking at where we can uh, establish, uh, because areas of between uh, 1,000 uh, meters above sea level and 2,100 meters above sea level, here we are looking at uh, different uh, places. Uh, I may not have uh, them at the, uh, the fingertips, but uh, it is important to know there are some areas which may, uh, we, I may say, for example, that you can talk about Embu, and uh, Embu has also a great range of variations, because you'll find the places in Embu, like uh, near Runyanges, they are quite elevated. Avocado do very well in those areas. When you go towards the lower parts of Embu in areas like Ishara, um, they are quite low and uh, hot. And uh, those are uh, areas that are around 1,000 meters uh, above uh, sea level. So when you're looking at about areas, that's why I try to point out we have uh, many areas, areas like Bomet, we have seen that uh, avocado is also doing very well. Areas like uh, Kitale here in Moranga is a traditional area that uh, avocado has grown. We have areas like uh, uh, Meru where avocado has grown. We may even be able to do avocado in, in Machakos. Avocado has done so well, but you'll find in other areas going lower uh, than um, say Machakos town, which is quite uh, elevated, the Moor area is quite elevated. There are other areas when you're going towards Makueni, it's uh, a little bit lower, but the challenge now in these areas become availability of water. But uh, being uh, able to fruit, the avocado should be able to fruit at those areas, but now the challenge becomes the amount, uh, the water, uh, availability. If you can be able to overcome the issue of water, then avocado will be able to grow uh, very comfortable. Areas of Kisi have traditionally been able to grow and provide good. In fact, uh, most of the seed for uh, rootstocks have been uh, sourced from
from that uh, particular uh, area. So uh, I think one, uh, those are some of the areas. I'm not uh, mentioning all uh, the areas. Those are some of the areas uh, of Western Kenya, Bungoma. Uh, the other important aspect uh, are issues uh, like uh, the other important aspect are issues of the soil. How are we looking at the soil? When you're looking at the soils, you may have the right altitude, but what is uh, happening with the soil? With clay soils, the catch is uh, when they retain a lot of moisture. Therefore, they may have caused problems with root uh, diseases. So that is uh, one of the things I hope uh, I've covered uh, that one. Uh, because in Kenya, we can be able to grow this crop virtually in most of the areas, so long as we look at the parameters for temperatures, give it plus or minus five degrees Celsius, then you will be able to uh, do avocado in this particular uh, areas. Another aspect we need also to know when you're looking also at that is the temperature ranges. Why they are given the optimum of 20 to 24 degrees Celsius is when you now start having issues with abiotic stress or biotic stress of pests. Pests in warm areas, we know pests become uh, much of a problem and management of pests becomes uh, a bigger problem. So uh, those are aspects that we need to look at when we are trying to uh, select a good site for production uh, of avocado. I hope uh, our participants are okay with that. Number two, the type of uh, irrigation that can be used. Uh, in this country, we use quite a number of different types of irrigation. Uh, many people have, uh, we have gotten used to flood irrigation. Uh, others, you can do sprinkler and there is also drip. And uh, drip irrigation usually is the most efficient method of applying uh, water. But then why I was showing the canopy ages of that particular uh, picture initially was to help us also understand the positioning of the area where we need to concentrate our irrigation of the tree. And uh, yes, you may decide to go uh, flood irrigation, but that one is a very wasteful method of irrigation. Sprinkler irrigation does work. Many large farms go for sprinkler irrigation and other farms also go for drip irrigation. So those are the three methods that we can be able uh, to employ uh, to use uh, irrigation. Now on the guidelines uh, for uh, the nurseries, uh, I believe there was a code which I don't have on my hands, but as we continue with, uh, uh, with the discussion, we shall be able to come up and I'll be able to pick that uh, up for you. But normally all these um, facilities must have uh, registration uh, documentation. And uh, when sourcing avocado, I think uh, it is a problem uh, with us Kenyans that uh, many a times we like calling and asking, do you have it? And someone says yes, and uh, we get them delivered without uh, cross-checking some of uh, these aspects. But one of the aspects is to just to be able to see, uh, I believe, uh, I don't know if it's the Avocado Society that has a register, but uh, HCD has a register of certified uh, nurseries. And uh, once the nursery is certified, then you should be able to have records of or rather a certificate of inspection from KFIS. About the SMS and the code, we will get to that. I'll be able to confirm on that and uh, get back uh, to us. But those are the guidelines uh, that people have just to utilize and uh, be able to get some information also from uh, HCD, which has a register of all the uh, of all of the nurseries that have been registered uh, by them, because that is the start. Of, uh, of it. Thank you. Any other, have I tackled all of them, Ricky? Yes, I think that's quite clear. Let's, uh, we can move on to the next uh, 
uh, segment, but even as we do that, uh, just to remind our uh, audience, uh, please uh, use the chat box um, to raise any questions or, uh, or comments. You can use the chat box or the Q&A. And please also, if you would uh, not mind just saying, you know, where you're following us from, who's, you know, just introduce yourself briefly um on the chat box we also have a survey that is running if you haven't uh, had a moment to um uh, to do it then please uh, just uh, take some time and carry out the survey unfortunately um our intended moderator for the day nekesa wafula is not able to join us she has been held up in in traffic but uh, we are moving on well um and thank you all for joining us uh dr Were, please proceed to the next segment thanks all right, thank you. You have the controls, Ricky, yeah? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ricky. All right, the next segment, we want to look at uh, control of uh, pests, disease, physiological disorders, and uh, weeds. And uh, you know, this, uh, I've um, tried just to bring uh, things uh, together so that we can be able to cover, though this covering it uh, in one go would have been a, a tall order, rather was a bit of a tall order, but we are trying to look at uh, what we can be able to cover for this particular uh, session. And uh, important to note that uh, control, uh, rather the rather pests and diseases are significantly reduced by how we start with the establishment of uh, our crop. One of the most important thing is selection of the orchard site. The selection of the orchard site will impact greatly on the pests because where you have your orchard, that is uh, how the soils are draining, proximity uh, to other uh, fields and other crops, uh, can really impact the management of pests uh, and the diseases. Then the selection of cultivars, the cultivars or the varieties that you uh, decide to use, when uh, they can really also impact the uh, management of pests and diseases. And that's why it is important to be able to understand uh, uh, the, or rather to get crops from certified um, areas that understand the rootstocks that are uh, good, even in uh, withstanding the different uh, biotic stresses that we have. Uh, and uh, also there's control of fertilizer or rather controlled fertilizer application, both fertilizer and manure uh, application, because it's very interesting that yes, the trees uh, require uh, fertilizer, they require enough uh, manure. However, there are some uh, aspects or some levels of uh, fertilization that cause the tree to become super succulent or too succulent and therefore attract, uh, rather cause the tree to have diseases or diseases to easily attack the tree. Another important thing is some timely application of uh, uh, sprays or uh, plant protection uh, products having a particular uh, program uh, which uh, others may uh, look at it differently because mainly here in this country uh, what has uh, a question I was discussing with uh, my CEO the other day and he was uh, telling me uh, why are we not able to capture this window that we have and we are not able to produce properly. It's because many of our producers have decided that this is a tree that you plant and leave it there. It will just yield for you. But then there are other aspects that we need to apply. Even if you don't want to apply very harsh uh, plant protection products, there are other plant protection products that can be able to cause uh, good uh, yield. And uh, orchard sanitation, how are we maintaining the cleanliness of our, of our orchards? We'll be able to look at that and timing of irrigation. But in spite of um, ensuring that you have undertaken all these aspects, uh, pests and disease 
may still occur because these are organisms that have been here for long uh, a time. And uh, for now, the pests and diseases in avocado that we would like just to touch on uh, this uh, afternoon uh, will include pests like red spider mites, avocado thrips, white flies, fruit flies, uh, we have false codling moth, scales, and uh, even we have uh, nematodes, which we may just mention. And uh, some of these nematodes, you may find some occurring in the rooting system, and others may be uh, affecting even the leaves. And then we have other, dis uh, other diseases like uh, avocado root rot. And here in under avocado root rot, we have various, we have Phytophthora and uh, Fusarium that can be a problem. Uh, we have issues like anthracnose, which is a serious problem affecting the leaves and the fruit uh, itself. And then also we have uh, scabs and sacrospora leaf spot that may affect uh, the different avocado trees. Uh, we may just look at management of uh, insect pests and uh, maybe start with the fruit fly. And uh, a fruit fly, um, it is an important uh, pest or insect pest. It is an important uh, insect in avocado because it is also considered to be a quarantine uh, pest, uh, whereby if uh, it is found in any uh, consignment, then the produce can be quarantined. Uh, rather cannot be exported, or if it's already been exported, it may be rejected. Uh, across. And uh, this one has been a problem in Kenya. Uh, and it even cost us to lose quite a bit of market, but thank God we managed to take care of it. And now we are ongoing. Um, some of the fruit flies, we have different types of fruit flies. We have uh, uh, some that may uh, lay eggs under the skin of the fruit that is just beginning to ripen. Uh, others may attack young and ad old fruits. So once they attack the fruits, they lay eggs under uh, the skin. So you may not be able to see them uh, clearly with the naked eye. And then the lesions end up appearing uh, as uh, a slight puncture mark are uh, surrounded by white exudate. And uh, try to give us uh, an example uh, of uh, that uh, there being uh, the fruit fly, which you can be observing. And if you find some of these, uh, you can be able to understand uh, and take quick management of the same. Others, uh, the, the fruit on the edge right there is just showing us uh, the kind of uh, aspect you might uh, find on the fruit, um, because when the lesion dries, and turns into a distinct star crack. It forms a crack on the surface. This whitish stuff that you may be seeing on that particular fruit could be as a result of the frost being produced by the uh, particular larvae, or at the same time, it can be as a result of saprophytic or uh, uh, other fungus now growing on the dead uh, tissue. How do we manage uh, the fruit flies uh, in our orchards. We are looking just at the basic methods of managing the fruit flies. One of them being proper orchard sanitation. Uh, and this is in combination with other natural uh, enemies. Uh, in, uh, right, natural enemies is an interesting area, which uh, I would uh, ask uh, probably my uh, uh, CEO Ricky will be able to talk to us about natural enemies. He's a guru in that. And um, another important aspect we need to look at is if you observe fallen fruit in uh, the field, it is important to collect this uh, fallen fruit and destroy. And you can destroy them by burying. And when we are talking about burying, here we are looking at you burying the fruit in uh, at least 60 centimeters deep. That way, then the larvae under the moth will not be able to uh, come out of the soil 
and uh, continue infecting. The other uh, method of using or destruction is if you collect all these fruits, you can dump them in a drum that is full of water and leave those fruits in there for a period of uh, uh, a week or in oil for a period of a week, uh, then that will have suffocated, uh, that will have uh, suffocated uh, the, will have suffocated the uh, fruit fly. Uh, other aspects you can ban also those fruits that uh, you collect. So this ensures that our orchards, uh, we observe the sanitation or the hygiene of the orchards. Another aspect is applying uh, baits or uh, fly traps. There are different baits. You can have some glue, uh, some plastics with uh, uh, applied glue on, on them and uh, put them around uh, the orchard. So as these insects are flying, they can stick onto these uh, traps, which we'll uh, refer to as uh, sticky traps, whereby you'll just have applied glue on uh, bright colored material, like uh, a yellow uh, plastic, then you can be able to trap them. Another important aspect is the use of commercial pheromone traps, whereby you can use things like uh, methyl eugenol, or uh, in other words, called uh, Bactrolua. And for Bactrolua, you require 20 traps per acre. So we are looking at having 10 tree traps. If you're looking at having, uh, based on your spacing, you're looking at having 80 to 100 trees uh, per acre. So 20 traps for uh, 80 to 100 uh, trips. It is important also to practice monitoring. And another way of using uh, traps, there is a, a, bet, a good way of just observing to understand if you've got uh, uh, fruit flies in your field is just having a bottle and make some holes and pour in uh, some vinegar and uh, some liquid soap. And this can be able to attract uh, fruit flies if they're within the area and when you monitor those particular traps, you can be able to know if you need to utilize uh, uh, commercial traps like methyl, uh, methyl eugenol, which is a pheromone trap. It attracts all the males, and uh, this helps in that the females will uh, lay eggs that are not viable, and therefore it protects uh, the avocado, uh, uh, avocado fruit. Uh, another aspect we need to look at uh, next is uh, the scales. Uh, and uh, for the scales, we have uh, two types of scales. Uh, I've put some names so that we can be able just to look at them, not to help us bite our tongue. Uh, so we have uh, this uh, coca species is one of the scales that is a soft bodied scale. And uh, the importance of this soft-bodied scale is um, it causes damage by also producing a lot of honeydew, a lot of um, substance as it feeds, it excretes a liquid uh, that uh, covers the avocado. And uh, once it covers the avocado, there are other fungus that may grow on it. There's a mold we refer to as sooty mold, which may grow onto the uh, fruit and also on, on uh, shoots. Now, the importance of uh, these scales, both the, the soft scales and the armored scales, is they also extract a lot of uh, nutrients from the tree. And uh, in uh, older, larger trees, they may not be very harmful, but in uh, young trees, they may uh, cause uh, different twigs even to die. Now, for the armored scales, uh, they may encrust the twigs, that is, they may cover all uh, the twigs and the leaves, and thereby also affect uh, the shoots from uh, developing if they are not uh, managed. And uh, on the fruits, I've uh, given a picture of the armored scales, how they appear on the fruit of avocado, which may result even to causing some discoloration. They may result in malformation of the fruit. Uh, and uh, also in severe infestations, you may find uh, the 
small uh, fruits dropping and uh, causing uh, a reduction in production. And also when you have the scales on your fruit, it may cause rejection, especially for those who are growing avocado for purposes uh, of export. Uh, management of this is uh, by using uh, natural enemies like parasitic, uh, there are some parasitic worms and some ladybird uh, beetles. Many people don't like uh, seeing ladybird beetles, these ones that look dotted, but it is important to be able to understand which is, it, which is the beneficial ladybird to those other ladybirds that uh, or the other um, uh, beetles, uh, which are pests. So it is important to be able to get to understand which are the beneficial uh, bugs that we are uh, utilizing. And then uh, it is important when you're using natural enemies, you avoid the use of broad spectrum pesticides. And at the same time, when these beneficial uh, microorganisms are uh, being introduced, and uh, due to the fact that the soft uh, scales produce honeydew. We normally have some ants. That's why I'm saying that we ensure that we also do not have ants uh, present. There are some ants which are referred to as attendant ants. They will not cause damage to the scales because they're collecting the honeydew or for themselves. But uh, once we manage the ants, we can be able to utilize uh, the ladybirds. And uh, also there are other plant protection products that can be utilized uh, for management of uh, the scales. And uh, when you're utilizing uh, those, it is important to understand that the scales will have a sheath or they cover themselves with a wax that uh, prevents even uh, them. So when you're using insecticides, it's good to look at insecticides mm. that are... Yes, insecticides uh, that are uh, uh, systemic so that they can be able to uh, get into the scales. Uh, if we could move to the next, which is trips, Ricky, I'll appreciate. Um, the trips, uh, they cause damage uh, to leaves and fruit and uh, uh, have uh, been able to give us a, a picture to appreciate how uh, damage by trips actually looks, which is causing that leathery brown uh, skin onto uh, the on, onto uh, the avocado, and uh, the catch with this one uh, is uh, as much as it may not uh, really affect uh, the yield, though if attacked uh, uh, if attacks the fruits at a very early stage, it may. Uh, result uh, into abortion of fruits, but that is an aesthetic or a physiological disorder uh, that people may, a quality disorder that people may not take that fruit. Uh, importance is use of uh, natural enemies and other predatory bugs such as uh, less wings. Uh, there are other insects uh, of importance which include mites, uh, they attack leaves and fruits. We have insect borers, uh, less bugs, and uh, even caterpillars. And uh, for caterpillars, it's easy to manage because we can use Bacillus thuringiensis uh, or uh, the one we refer to Bt, uh, which is important in uh, management of uh, different uh, 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 of different caterpillar pests. Now, of importance. Uh, I wanted us also a little bit to look at uh, false codling moth. Uh, uh, if we could move uh, ahead. False cod thank you, there is okay. False codling moth is an emerging um, pest uh, of avocado, and it has been observed to spread in quite a number of uh, crops. One aspect about this moth, it is active at night and the females end up laying eggs mostly on the uh, fruit, on the avocado fruit. And uh, after emerging uh, from the egg, the young caterpillars end up tunneling uh, the fruit and they obtain sap, all right? They obtain sap from the fruit. And that particular area where they've tunneled, 
uh, they'll ensure that is uh, uh, the area where they deliberate frass or uh, when they're excreting, uh, they remove the frass and you end up observing uh, a hole with the whitish frass coming out of uh, the avocado. And this occurs on the surface of the skin. In other aspects, you may find uh, uh, an, an area uh, whereby the larvae has tunneled into uh, the fruit and it has caused a brown spot. It causes brownish spots to occur on the affected fruit. And uh, if you cut that particular uh, brownish spot, you may observe the larva actually growing right under uh, the skin. And um, they do cause premature ripening and drooping of fruits, uh, which may occur in heavy uh, infestations. And this is also um, uh, a quarantine uh, pest. And uh, it is important that we be able to look at uh, how uh, this particular uh, pest uh, causes damage. Uh, to its management, uh, to its management, uh, one of the important factors is proper orchard sanitation. And uh, here, just like we had talked about uh, fruit fly, is it is important to be able to collect all infested fruit. And um, that is the fruits that have fallen from the tree. Uh, they should be removed regularly, at least twice uh, in a week. And these ones, they should be buried so as not to allow this uh, particular uh, insect. If the larvae is still in the avocado, we should not allow it to mature. And uh, the other aspect is also putting them uh, in a drum filled with water or oil. And uh, this you can be able to keep for a week and uh, cause asphyxiation of uh, this particular larvae and uh, you'll be able to manage uh, them. Uh, under management, uh, under proper field sanitation or orchard sanitation, it is important the area around the orchard, you must be able to uh, look at the availability of other host plants, other plants whereby false codling moth does attack. Uh, these include plants like citrus, even cotton, maize, castor, uh, and even tea. These are crops whereby the false codling moth can actually harbor. You may control it in the field, in your orchard, but if you have adjacent orchards that have these particular uh, crops, uh, including even uh, pepper or capsicum, it may harbor there and come and cause problem into the field uh, later on. And then there is also the use of pheromone traps. It is important. We can use pheromone traps to trap the males so that the eggs that are hatched are not uh, able uh, to, uh, uh, to or rather the eggs that are laid are not able to hatch. Thereby we'll have, uh, we'll have disrupted the mating uh, system of this particular insect. Um, seeing our time's running, but we can now look a little bit at uh, diseases. We are almost uh, there. Uh, Ricky, I think we can finish, then we'll be able to look at uh, the questions uh, together, if that is okay. Um, we look at uh, diseases. We have various uh, number of uh, diseases that uh, uh, we have to look at. Uh, we have others uh, like anthracnose, which is a fungal uh, disease. And primarily it may affect uh, the fruit in the field, but it's primarily a post-harvest problem when uh, fruit is at maturity, uh, when the fruit is at uh, maturity. And uh, the damage that it causes, it causes depressed uh, lesions. It does cause uh, depressed uh, lesions on the fruit. Uh, and uh, this lesion may be manifested as a rot. And uh, the lesion, to be able to differentiate this lesion from the other brown uh, coloration we observed with the false codling moth, 
you'll find these lesions of anthracnose are a bit sunken. They are a bit depressed. And uh, once they have been uh, depressed uh, into uh, the flesh, you'll find that the, if there is enough moisture and humidity, you'll find that there is some growth occurring. Like in this fruit we are seeing, we are seeing some growth occurring at the top. That is the uh, damage that uh, anthracnose uh, poses. If not managed, you'll find uh, this anthracnose can spread into uh, the whole uh, tree. Um, management is removal of dead branches and twigs. One of the aspects is once you observe the trees that are uh, severely damaged due to anthracnose, when you look at the veins of the leaves, that is another aspect you can be able to be able to, uh, to know uh, if a tree has been infected. When you look on, at the back of the leaf, you will observe the veinlets of that leaf having a blackish coloration that is running along the veins of the leaf. And when you observe this, it is important uh, to be able to uh, cut any of those uh, branches because those are the branches that will be harboring uh, the fungus and burn those. Then there is pruning of uh, uh, the limbs or rather the branches, uh, at least two feet of the ground. And you ensure there's increased uh, circulation because when there's increased circulation in the tree and in the orchard, then the, there is no humidity that will result in this particular fungus producing the spores that will infect the next uh, tree. Then even after we have done our pruning, it's to, important to remove all trees and uh, all prunings and debris from under the tree that uh, this prevents uh, the pathogen from reproducing and infecting uh, the trees. And then remove also all rotten, um, all rotten fruits uh, from the field. And uh, then also apply uh, copper-based fungicides before flowering. You can also apply a copper-based fungicide at fruit formation and also after harvest. This will help, this will help to ensure uh, that your fruit can be uh, safe even at a uh, harvest uh, time. Uh, we have a disease by uh, the scab. Uh, scab is an important one also uh, because uh, it causes quite some gray uh, symptoms. It causes lesions or spots appear to be small dark uh, spots and when they form, when they come together, when these come together, they may elongate and uh, give a cocky appearance on the surface of the fruit. How do we manage them? Uh, most of these uh, diseases, as you may have understood, first important thing is field hygiene or field sanitation. Uh, by here we are uh, referring to removing of all dead plant material. We remove all the dead plant material from the field. We uh, collect all rotten uh, fruits. And then there is also the application of uh, copper-based fungicides because these are broad spectrum and they will be able to protect uh, the fruit when we apply even at uh, the time of uh, flowering and uh, at uh, fruit uh, formation. Uh, another important aspect is uh, that of Sarcospora uh, leaf spot, uh, primarily being a disease, um, a problem of inequality. And uh, this one will find Sarcospora uh, uh, affecting the roots both in the field and uh, uh, also, it may continue occurring if the fruit is still in storage. Now you'll find there's a lesion uh, that will appear or a spot that will appear as a small, a small light yellow spot on the fruits and leaf surfaces. But as it continues, the cells will die and you find uh, a dry like um, a rot or a dry like lesion on a fruit with a cracked uh, aspects which I've been able just to bring and uh, still management here we are looking at field uh, sanitation and also application of copper based uh, fungicides. Then uh, finally we have other 
uh, fungal uh, diseases uh, that uh, are important uh, in, uh, in the field and they end up being revealed during uh, storage. Anthracnose is one of them which we have uh, mentioned uh, earlier. And the other important one is the stem end rot. And uh, the stem end rot is caused by uh, fungus. And uh, this one uh, is, it affects uh, the plant due to our management in the field, how we are harvesting. Uh, and it may result in rot uh, spreading rapidly to the rest of the fruit. The small pale brown spots may appear initially uh, in the stem, stem zone of that particular fruit. And once they have entered into the fruit, it ends up rapidly uh, spreading in the fruit and uh, thereby causing uh, the pulp to be infected uh, in the fruit. So these are aspects that uh, have to be taken care of. Another important aspect was that one of uh, um, uh, of fusarium uh, root rot and uh, phytophthora uh, root rot. And these ones are uh, very serious in areas where uh, the, there is a lot of moisture because the moisture causes uh, the spores to move uh, rapidly uh, fast. One of the important aspects is first of all to start ensuring uh, there's drainage in the field that will help to curtail any uh, spread of uh, the zoospores. And then there is also the application uh, of uh, chemicals that will help in management uh, of, uh, of uh, the root rot. There are some areas which we can drench uh, pot force, uh, which can help us manage uh, the, the root rots. And uh, in other areas, the, the drenching is in uh, small fruit trees. Uh, but in uh, really grown trees and they're having these problems, uh, there are those uh, potfuls that can be injected actually in the back just to help uh, these particular crops uh, heal. I think I wanted to tackle that for today. And uh, maybe when we'll be looking at issues of uh, marketing, that's when we look at the post-harvest uh, diseases that uh, do uh, impact uh, uh, that, that uh, value chain of uh, market. Uh, access. Thank you very much. That's it for today. Thanks, Ricky. Thank you very much, uh, Samuel. I think uh, we are going to just uh, look briefly. We have a few minutes to look at uh, additional questions and uh, and answers that uh, have been raised. And uh, I think the first one, Samuel, that you uh, may comment on is the productivity. Um, what are the kind of yields? This, um, these questions are related. One is on the yields that we should be uh, working towards. Um, and at which point from establishment of the orchard, uh, um, at what age actually do we then come into uh, uh, production on an ideal uh, basis? And then also related to that, is there a recommended uh, minimum planting uh, uh, acreage? Maybe you could talk of the productivity per acre, but uh, what, what is the at least minimum plan, uh, recommended planting acreage that one um, should strive towards? Thank you. All right. Thank you, Ricky. Um, when we are looking at uh, uh, yield. Uh, we'll start by looking at uh, uh, the amount of the planting. Based on the planting uh, of the avocado, the spacing, we are uh, looking at you having at least uh, 80 to 100 trees uh, per acre. And uh, these trees, uh, as much as some trees may, you may start finding some trees yielding uh, per two years, but you'll observe that the optimum yields uh, you may start uh, receiving from the third, fourth year, that's when you'll uh, start receiving uh, optimum uh, uh, yields. And uh, here we are uh, looking at uh, the pieces uh, of uh, uh, yield. When you uh, take good care of uh, 
the avocado tree, you should be uh, in the third, fourth year, you should be yielding about 500 uh, pieces of uh, avocado per tree. So that translates to about uh, from four, between 4,000 and 5,000 uh, pieces uh, per acre. Uh, and uh, the yields uh, will keep increasing as the tree uh, matures. So also uh, the edge of the tree will uh, affect uh, the, the yield. The edge of the tree, how you take care of that particular tree will end up also affecting uh, the yield. Okay, great. Um, I see, I think again, uh, two more uh, questions. Um, the first one, and uh, uh, just appreciating that we are looking um, even uh, when it comes to the control of pests and diseases, some of the points that Dr. Were uh, has mentioned that may actually be answering the questions, but um, what, what we've been asked is for those who are keen uh, on organic and are also trying to encourage uh, beneficial insects um, in their farms, uh, is there any specific guideline, for example, to observe when it comes to the use of pesticides and um, uh, protecting insects such as bees? Uh, so that's one, uh, one specific um, uh, question. And also in the initial years of the orchard, um, before the third year, uh, is it possible to have any other commercial crops grown in the same space, is it recommended? Um, uh, what do you have to say on that? Thanks. All right, so uh, by use of uh, insecticide, I uh, wouldn't like to really mention uh, types of insecticide uh, to use, but it's important uh, to ensure that uh, we do not uh, kind of target, use a broad spectrum, but uh, we tend to go to uh, specific uh, chemicals that are target uh, oriented that will target on a particular uh, uh, insect that we are looking at and not very harsh chemicals and that's the reason as to why you've seen I have put more emphasis on uh, us looking at the use uh, of uh, various uh, biological methods that are at uh, our disposal and uh, one of the most important and uh, because avocado is an easy crop, one of the most important things to ensure is field hygiene. Because once we spray very harsh uh, chemicals, we'll end up uh, affecting the bees and that will thus uh, affect or it will have an impact on the pollination. So I wouldn't like to specifically touch on the uh, pesticides or say which pesticides will not harm uh, the bees. Uh, another aspect, um, Ricky, you spoke about was intercropping. And uh, with intercrop, uh, here now it real, there are very many aspects uh, that come into play when you're looking at intercropping. One of the aspects that come into play when you're looking at intercropping is what, where are you going to, uh, what, what is your target market for this avocado? Even when it starts yielding and you still have space in between. because an aspect is what plant protection products, what chemicals are you going to use in the intercrop that may have an impact on uh, the avocado at a later uh, time. Yes, you may be able to use, but also putting in mind where the root zone is, where the canopy is reaching, because as you continue cultivating, you may end up causing injury also to the avocado uh, roots. So those are aspects uh, that we may need to look at because standards come into play, whereby some standards do not require you intercropping uh, avocado with other crops because of the cross-contamination of plant protection products and different fertilizers that they may be used. Great, yeah. thank you very much, uh, Dr. Were. Um, to and maybe, participants- maybe Ricky. Yes, maybe yes, Ricky, yes, some ahead. people may want, I was just giving uh, pieces because different people want different uh, calculations for uh, the yield. 
uh, if there are some people who want in kilograms, I just noticed I gave in pieces because most of our avocado, we sell it in uh, pieces. And uh, if we are looking at yield, um, an avocado that's around three or four years can give you uh, up about uh, 250 to 300 kilos, uh, which translates, uh, that's per acre, which translates to about uh, 7.5 to 10 tons per hectare of fruit. That is per year, per, that's per season, once you have gotten your fruit. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ere. So um, to our audience, uh, we've been following the, the questions. You know, we have some, uh, we've had some questions coming from the audience on Facebook, but also from um, those who have been uh, actively participating on this particular uh, uh, webinar. We are at the end of today's um, session. And we, again, just to give a quick summary, we've been looking at how to optimize um, productivity for avocado. Um, that is a first step uh, in order to ensure you have um, proper market access and you actually have um, a profitable and sustainable business. And um, just some of the highlights from uh, our presenter for today, this is Dr. Were. Uh, as ha have been covered by other experts in preceding um, segments, it all starts with um, having a very clear establishment of your orchard in the right site, um, and then using uh, recommended or good agricultural practices all through from uh, testing the soil and establishing the, the orchard, and then moving forward to managing the nutrition and irrigation aspects of uh, of, of production. We um, encourage you to share your feedback. We have a link that is on the chat box. We will be we're just having it shared once again just now. If you could take a few minutes and click on that link, we would really appreciate your, uh, your feedback. But um, even as we close and uh, looking at the, the critical issues of pests and diseases, um, that affect productivity. I think it already begins to be clear that um, it is actually good practice that will ensure we uh, can control these pests and diseases. Um, the use of uh, crop protection products uh, or pesticides is to supplement good practice. It is not to replace good practice. Uh, the key points have been mentioned, uh, simple, points like avoiding overwatering um, and field sanitation, uh, but also uh, the right selection of cultivars to suit your particular growing area. Um, we encourage you to get in touch with us uh, via our contacts. This is at SOCA in case you require uh, further clarification, but we shall make this presentation available um, on our website even as we move towards uh, the next segment next week where we shall be looking at optimizing um, market access. And there is where actually the issues lie. What happens from the point at which um, we come towards uh, harvesting the avocado and then moving into the market and where do we go wrong um, such that the product that uh, is on the shelf uh, both in the domestic and um, frequently we get the reports from the export markets. The product does not meet the quality specifications um, or the quality uh, expectations of the consumers. Uh, last but not least, because um, it is important as we do our production to work uh, towards what the market needs, I think ours is to emphasize that in all the operations during the production phase, it is important for an enterprise owner to keep records, um, to keep records of all those practices, to keep records of um, your rootstock and where you get your rootstock, keep your records because those records are then your ticket in the marketplace and the ones that help you to take corrective action um, in future based on the feedback or reports that you do receive. So I think with that, uh, to our listeners um, and audience, we want to just thank you for being part of this uh, webinar that has been brought to you once again 
through a collaboration between uh, SOCA, Society of Crop Agribusiness Advisors, and um, She Trades uh, Commonwealth uh, project, Program. Um, I would ask Dr. Wery, he might have maybe a final uh, remark, a closing remark, if he uh, would want to share anything, and then we shall sign off uh, for today and uh, meet you again next week uh, from three o'clock um, to 4.30. Dr. Wery. All right, thanks, Ricky. Uh, all I can say is uh, let's just strive to ensure that uh, we do uh, good agriculture and uh, sustainable uh, agriculture and uh, we shall be able to uh, make you to utilize this window that we have in Kenya of uh, producing uh, avocado and uh, I believe we are able and even the number of growers as much as it's tending towards the large scale growers even uh, the other growers can be able to come and optimize uh, the inputs and also increase uh, yield. So thank you and uh, wish you all the best. Great, thanks. Thank you very much, Dr. Were. So kindly to um, those who have been with us, uh, we do respect the time that you have invested in today's session once again. If you would just take a minute to fill the survey, um, there's a link that has been shared in the chat box. We would really appreciate your feedback. Um, otherwise, we look forward to engaging with you when we come to now discussing how to optimize uh, market access, how to deal with the post-harvest um, challenges that uh, bring down the quality. And uh, within that session, we will have, um, in addition to uh, Dr. Were, some of the key participants in the market uh, focused side of uh, the avocado value chain. So thank you once again for your participation. We wish you all um, uh, a good evening. Kindly do visit www.soca.or.ke and you will be able to access um, a, pre a recording of this particular webinar, which is actually on our YouTube uh, channel. Um, kindly visit that and uh, we do hope to interact with you once again next week. Thank you very much. <laughs>